you know, you lose a baseball game, I guess. And then you're like, well, you know, camaraderie and, you know. But listen, man, be honest with yourself. You were out there to win that goddamn game. It's funny because uh, I just reread uh, American Buffalo, which I told you is one of my favorites. But even though I hadn't read it in probably 10 years, I think about a line in the book like probably once a week. Uh, it's the scene, you you find this buffalo skull mm-hmm. and uh, you pick it up and you just start sort of asking yourself these questions about like who shot it first, like who found it first. Like I think you have a, you're like, what did this person think about this? What time did they wake up in the morning? What did they think about God? I think about that question all the time. Whenever I come across something really old, like this is a, this building I'm talking to you in is like a hundred and something years old. I think about like the person that sat in this room before me and like what went through their head, what their understanding of the world was like. And that, that line in the book has always struck me as a, as a very beautiful encapsulation of that idea. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's, it's particularly vexing around when you get back into deep enough into history, like I spent a lot of time in that Buffalo book talking about Ice Age, you know, the Ice Age hunters. Yeah. And um, what the problem there is, is we'll never, ever, ever know. I mean, barring some like incredibly, just in bar, barring some incredible scientific breakthrough that I can't even understand that would like border into metaphysics, uh, I, I don't think we're ever going to know um, 10,000 years ago, 11,000 years ago, 12, whatever, what those people thought about anything. Yes. Like what they thought about anything, man. And even the stuff that they left behind carvings and things. Uh, yes. You just never know. Uh, I was reading recently about, a there was a mammoth hunting culture in Siberia and, they found these two children that were buried with 500 beads made of mammoth tusk ivory. Uh, why, right? <laughs> sure. There's no one to ask. <laughs> but, do, but don't you think when you do an activity that is somewhat timeless, it's the closest you get to that. For instance, in the Havelina video, which I have probably watched 30 times now because it's the it's favorite one for some reason, even though where we live, there's boars, like wild boars. So you'd think he'd be into those hunts, but he likes the Havelina one. We've never yeah. seen a Havelina out in central Texas. Um, but you're, you're like looking for shelter in that video and you just stumble across cave paintings in this like little cave by someone who almost certainly was doing the exact same thing that you were doing. So you don't really know what they think, but it couldn't have been that different than what you're doing, which is like walking around looking for an animal to kill. Yeah, I think so, man. I I think that, that you're bound, like one thing that binds hunters over time, at least the really dedicated ones is uh, with notable exceptions is what, what binds them is like a real reverence for animals a deep desire to understand animals but man you know like growing up you know coming from a like a theist culture right and having that upbringing it's so hard to understand animism you know like yeah the the, the way people used to you know people used to imagine that all, all these animate and inanimate objects had some sort of desires and individuality. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it, it's, you, you feel like you, you, you feel a connection to it because the discipline is so similar, right? Like there's, they are the, the, the animals are have, the animals are unchanged, right? Yeah. They haven't gone through a cognitive revolution. Like the animals are unchanged. The, 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 their sensory perceptions are unchanged. Their habits are largely unchanged. So you're, you're engaging, you're engaging with something that, that, that half of the equation is unchanged, right? 
and a big part of like the big part of the a big portion of the human equation is unchanged too. Like the things you need to do, right? The the physicality of it, like that's unchanged. But the the spiritual component, whatever that was, man, I marvel about it. You know, uh, it, you know, you, for some reason, it feels good to think that maybe you maybe you can approach that level of understanding that people might have had for their environment. But then it's going this might be straying a little too far from what what you're asking, but I spent time with Amerindians in South America hunting with people who uh hunting with people who hunt two hundred hunt and fish two hundred and fifty days a year within a fifty mile radius of not only their home but their father's home, grandfather's home, great grandfather's home, on and on and on and on and on. And the level of understanding they have for their environment far exceeds anything you will achieve living in the United States of America. You will not get you will not get there. <laughs> it's it's sort of like looking at the stars. You feel both like really small and really big at the same time. Mm-hmm. Right. I think when you when you think about like the past, you get these moments of connection to this unbroken chain of human beings and at the same time feel totally removed from whatever their conception of the world and the tradition that they came from at the same time. Yeah. One, and one of the beauties of hunting is that it's a continuum. However you define the beginning of history, it's been going on uninterrupted for that long yes right with only a handful of other things like there's a handful of activities yeah if you're into like stand up paddle boarding you cannot (laughs) say the same thing about stand up paddle boarding it's like you're like it's a new thing that someone recently thought up but (laughs) but hunting is like is is, you know it's pardon me but it's it's just more legitimate (laughs) Epictetus said that philosophy wasn't this dry, abstract thing. It was a thing he said you should be talking about, writing down, reading about, exploring with other people all the time. He said constantly have it at hand. That's how I think about philosophy. And it's weird. For the last five years, every single day, I've been writing this free email about Stoic philosophy. It's been not just cool to meet all these fellow practitioners of Stoic philosophy, but in writing about it, talking about it, reading it for our podcast, I have got to internalize these ideas in a way that I never would have been able to under any other circumstances. That's the idea. Philosophy is something we're supposed to engage in, not keep in these dusty old books or read once and be done with. It's a constant process. And I think that's why the email has worked so well for the people reading about it and sharing it and talking about it, all of that as well. So I'd love to have you join us on this email. You can sign up at dailystoic.com slash daily email. It's totally free, no spam. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I've basically given away a book for free every single year for five years, and I'm gonna keep on doing it till I drop dead. Check it out, dailystoic.com slash daily email. You know, I was thinking about that recently. I was telling someone, uh, you know who Dusty Baker is? Like the baseball player and the manager, he manages the, um, the Astros right now. No, dude, he, I'm so bad on sports. I got some friends that play professional sports, and I know about them. <laughs> well, so he's like he's like 80. He's the manager of the Astros okay. right now. He was a great baseball player for the A's. Oh, and he's still a manager. He's still a manager at 80. That's good. Yeah, yeah, but but this is this will blow your mind. He got the first high five. Is that right? Like, yeah, like one of his teammates was at a beginning. Yeah, in the seventies, like in the in the late so like yeah, some of these things we think are so old are really super new. But you're just like that guy. His 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 teammate was coming in from a home run. He had his hand up in the air, and so Dusty Baker like put his hand up in the air, and then boom, and then this thing that we think is a ubiquitous part of like human culture and connection, like. <laughs> this one guy was there when it happened. So yeah, like we think that we 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 will never get that kind of of connection deeper further back than it's it's weird how it's weird how ancient and then also recent like culture is let me uh do this is so far astray but i I, you taking interest in that makes me want to tell you a thing i heard a linguist talking about this linguist was explaining their work to someone and they were saying how they were giving a for instance of the kind of thing they're interested in and they were talking about 
a waitress or waiter saying, are you still working on that? Yeah. There was a time when no one had said that. And then somehow, right, in the 70s, people were not saying, are you still working on that? But somehow it like, right? He's like, Mm -hmm. this linguist was saying, where did that begin? And how did it do what it did? <laughs> but isn't isn't that it, it actually is not that far of uh, afraid uh, uh, because like that's what memes are, right? Like right now we think of memes as like funny graphics that spread on the internet, but memes in the Richard Dawkins sense are like ideas that spread, right? Someone comes yeah. up with an idea and then people copy it. You think about all these techniques in hunting that at one point did not exist. Or mm-hmm. tools that did not exist. And then someone was like, hey, if you do it this way, uh, you know, it's much better. And then because it actually is better, it beats out the old way of doing things. And that could have that could have happened over five years. It could have happened over 5,000 years, right? Yeah. And and we can only guess at it from the, ar- uh, the archaeological history. But like, all these things were invented by ingenious humans at some point, and now monkeys are picking up on some of them, which is also terrifying. In uh, in my lifetime, I have seen uh, things that are now like dominant, sort of the dominant hunting practices. I have seen them emerge, strategies that have become like adopted by a, like a, a large margin of people who are really into a certain discipline. And I always wonder, like, but did they really? Do you know I mean, like, it has to be that you're coming back around and rethinking of something. You know? That's probably true. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably true. You know, I was thinking about this. I, I went to, to Budapest uh, right before the pandemic. And I sort of knew vaguely that Marcus Aurelius had written chunks of meditations there. And so sort of walking around. You can go in this old Roman camp. You're walking around. And then um, there's a hot springs that you can sit in. There's a cool one in Big Ben too that we were just at. But um, you're sitting in this hot springs and you know, you're the hot, the cold, the hot and the cold. And you're like, oh man, this is also something human beings have been doing for thousands of years. Like from the same germ, uh, geothermal, like freakish uh, occurrence, hot water's coming up and people are like, life is dusty and disgusting and it feels good to go from hot to cold. And that like, Whatever the feeling experience I'm having right now, the most powerful person in the world had in this spot 2,000 years ago. That's mm-hmm. fucking weird. <laughs> That's good. That's good. You know, Mar- Marcus Aurelius was, uh, talks in meditations a handful of time about hunting boars. And they think he was a hunter that he hunted with the Emperor Hadrian, who was himself a pretty big hunter. I, I think about uh, that that what I've read is that like as a young man, they hunted together and that this was partly where Hadrian gets the sense that Marcus Aurelius might have what it takes uh, to be emperor. Cause Marcus Aurelius oh, really? is not, he's not Hadrian's son. He's adopted. So five emperors in a row adopt a male heir to become emperor. Uh, and so what does he see in this young boy? I, I've always wondered if it was something while they were hunting, because hunting boar, the Romans hunted them on horses with spears, and then they had they had slaves carry nets also. And hmm. I just think about how terrifying and stressful, like hunting boars with a rifle is not the 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 least scary thing in the world. I can only imagine chasing them on a horse with a spear and what you would learn about someone watching how they do that. Yeah, you'd learn a lot about the horse too. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Well, so one of the re- people might think it's weird that I, I have my five-year-old watch videos of somebody hunting. Uh, and, and it came because he likes watching these videos. A friend of mine lives in this ghost town in California, and he makes videos about like going into the mines and doing stuff. And YouTube was like, oh, you might like this other video. And I was like, Clark, I, I know this person. We should watch this one. And that's how he got into them. But weirdly, why I think the the the, the Netflix show and, and and the YouTube episodes are so good is that ostensibly you're hunting an animal, but really each episode is you going on a journey. You're trying to figure something out. You're trying to do something hard. And then uh, you put in all the work and then you may or may not get rewarded by the end of the episode, mm-hmm. right? 
Yeah, and and yeah. to me, to me though, the main lesson that I talk to him about over and over again is actually the episodes where you don't get the animal, um, either because you did something wrong, which occasionally happens. But to me, I'm most interested because I'm I'm just working now on this book about temperance or self discipline. Mm. I'm always amazed at the episodes where you have a shot, but it's not quite the shot you want, and then you choose not to take it. Or like you have two minutes of daylight, like legal daylight left. And then you go, no one would actually see if I waited five minutes longer, but I'm not going to like, I, I'm interested in that element of your sort of hunting persona, because it seems, it seems like a very cultivated part of who you are. And you talk about it in the outdoor book and you talk about it in the American Buffalo book that like the sort of rules that a hunter enforces on themselves are kind of the most important thing. Um, there's a, you know, one of the people we regard as sort of one of the, the fathers of modern wildlife conservation and also in some ways, you know, a, a person who was deeply influential to me, though, he, you know, we never crossed paths, uh, is a guy named Aldo Leopold, who did, uh his most famous work is San County Almanac, right? Which is a, which was basically a collection of things that he had written during the sort of dark ages of American wildlife, which is around the 1920s. Um, he had once said that, you know, ethics is doing the right thing when no one's watching. Um, for me, it, it, it was, a uh, that trying to like as hard as you can adhere to the law <clears throat> and adhere to ethics uh, was was not that, that was learned behavior. Uh, we yeah. we took a lot of liberties when we were young, man. You, you just mentioned like legal shooting light, you know. When we were in high school, uh, we would go in and hunt wood ducks in a place where the wood ducks didn't start coming into this pond until after legal light, you know, and we'd hunt it anyway and not really even give it any thought. And it was funny cause that had, I had been brought up that way. Like I had been brought up where people I grew up around, my dad was a world war two veteran. He had me very old when he was old. He hung out with world war two veterans. So these are patriotic people who made tremendous sacrifices for their country. Right. But, they had a very strange relationship, a very selective understanding of like what laws were for and what they were meant to do. They were interested in sort of the spirit of the law. Like they were more interested in capturing like kind of what the law was getting at rather than all these like intricate components of it. And you also kind of a you can't tell me what to do kind of thing. Sure. And it was like, if you tell me I'm allowed a deer, okay, I accept that. I'm allowed a deer. Don't tell me like how to get it and when to get it. Right? So they, they had this yeah. like really like, or I'm allowed to catch X number of fish. I'm not allowed to sell them, but how is that your business? <laughs> like I accept that I'm allowed 50 perch a day. Fine. But don't tell me I can't sell them. It's just like, I, I, looking back on it, it's like so hard to understand the mentality, you know. But over the years, um, over the years, I, I became, for, for a variety of reasons, man, I understood why the, I, I understand why the game laws are there. Um, I have faith in and accept how they're, how they're arrived at, okay? Like, I understand the system and I understand what it's going for. Even things that strike me as like not a good idea or, you know, came about in ways that the laws that are now largely feel obsolete to me, I do it because it's doing so is you stepping forward and saying, I accept this program. I accept this, this, this mission that we're on and I'll give blind allegiance to it because I agree with like the principle of the whole thing. Right. And until that, if something were to happen in the future where I would lose that sense, and I can see this being a thing that happened depending on like socio political things, 
that I could see all of a sudden feeling like I was thrust into, you know, like, like forced into like being an outlaw. Right. Yeah. If, if hunting all of a sudden became because of, because of cultural, social stuff, like hunting became categorically illegal, but I still felt that the wildlife, um, that, the, the wildlife management aspect, the, the, the wildlife populations were s- sustainable and all that, I would have, we'd be having a very different conversation right now. Well, I probably wouldn't sure. be talking to anybody. I'd probably be very, very <laughs> quiet. <laughs> but, but right now in America, like we have a, we have, this is going to sound, well, yeah, I guess I'm an American. I am an American exceptionalist. We have the best system in the world for managing wildlife. And I uh, support it. And when you're filming things and distributing media, I think you have on top of that even a, a higher obligation to demonstrate a certain behavior. Because, because people pay attention to you, right? Like people are paying attention to you. Well, I do imagine the cameras keep you honest in the sense that you, you're at, you're, you're, if you're going around breaking the laws, you're also filming yourself doing it. But like, even, even the, the, the legality of it aside, I've always been struck by, you're like, you know what? I know I just tracked this bear or whatever for three days, but I can't quite tell if it's a male or a female, or it's just not the one that I want. Right. Yeah. Like human beings are really bad at being almost close to what we want. And then say, like, this is what the marshmallow test is. Right. Do you want one now or two later? But you got to wait for the other two. Human beings are incredibly bad at delayed gratification. And so I have been struck by the, the virtue of temperance in hunting. It's like, OK, you're there and an OK deer shows up. You don't know if a better one is coming later. Can you say, like, I'm comfortable miss i'm comfortable getting nothing as opposed to rushing this one that i know isn't really what i want yeah i've had so many you know i've been lucky in that my in that my professional life and my personal passions overlap so perfectly um I've had so many experiences now that if you told me that I could, that all I could do at this point was just like go relive them all, I'd be like, man, that sounds great. Right? Yeah. I'd be ha- totally happy with that. I think that getting to that place, like just being able to scratch the itch um, so thoroughly get you to a spot where like you become, you're, you're a little bit less impetuous. You don't like the, the kind of uh lust for not lust for success, but just like the impulsiveness starts to die out in you. You know, when, when sure. I was younger, man, like if a, if an opportunity presented itself, um, even if it wasn't perfect, even if it wasn't what you wanted, it just felt like you kind of like, who am I to like turn away an opportunity? Yeah. At success. Same way if I think about being a writer, you know, when I was coming out of graduate school, I took every assignment thing. I every because I was like, who am I? Like, who do I really think I am to not do this? It seems arrogant. Yeah. So if someone assigned me a book review of an author that I was intensely jealous of, right? And they wanted a positive review. I'd be like, "Okay, this is a bitter pill, but I'll <laughs> but I'll do it because who am I not to take this opportunity, right?" You know. And then later you get where you're like, "You know what, man? I just got other stuff I'm able to do that I'm more excited about. And I'm not. I'd, I'd rather just hang tight and work on the stuff that I feel really strongly about." And, and that comes in the outdoors. It's funny because. My older boy is really, he's at an age now. He'll be 12 a couple days here. Um, He's at an age now where he is really like old enough to understand. He's he's very passionate, very, very passionate about hunting and fishing. I never thought I would say this, almost annoyingly so. Um, He does not want to pass up opportunity. 
right? It's like, like marshmallow now. He'd take a mini marshmallow now over a bag of jumbos in five minutes. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. just like where yeah. he's at mentally, man. It's so funny to watch, right? And then you, you kind of hope he sort of quickly gets over <laughs> quickly gets over that. Do you think part of it, and this is something I, I think about a lot, is obviously the Stokes talk about it, is like detaching from outcomes, right? So if like you oh. really love the opportunity to go hunting, if you really love the tracking, the being outside, the doing the stuff, or if it's writing or working or whatever you do, then like you've already succeeded before you've even really mm-hmm. started, right? But then if if it's really like, no, I'm in this for the hardware, I'm in this for the cash, I'm in this for the fame, I'm in this for the 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 money or whatever the thing is, the Stoics would say you've put yourself in a pretty precarious position. One, because you might not get what you want. And then two, you you have trouble delaying gratification because the only reason you're doing this is to get the outcome and it feels like profoundly painful to pass up a certain outcome now for a better outcome later. Yeah. Uh, it, it's a great point. And, and one of the things I struggle with as I like sort of like train my kids up in this stuff too, is that in terms of delayed gratification, in terms of like, let me give you for instance. So we were one time calling, we were working a turkey. Okay. We're working a wild turkey and there's a turkey. He's gobbling a lot. We can't call him in, but he's still gobbling a lot. We're kind of moving around trying to like call him into us. And we come across a snapping turtle. Okay. And we're down in his Creek bottom. Uh, well, we're out of view of where the turkey is. And I say, like, I point to my boy. I'm like, look, there's a snap turtle. I was, I was going to show him how to sneak up behind it and grab it. When I grabbed it up, there's two of them. They're coupled, mating in the spring. He wants desperately to keep one of these snapping turtles to eat it, you know? But yeah. I was like, how you knew I had no way to kill it? You know, you'd have to basically shoot it with a shotgun or something. Um, and what about the turkey, right? And in that moment, man, he's totally like... <laughs> He's ready to be like, well, screw the the whole thing we've been talking about for weeks, you know, and yeah. the whole point we're here and all like licenses and shit. And in that minute, he's like leaning toward, I'd rather just have this, not even, this isn't even a thing he had even thought about before. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like a totally impulsive, right? Opportunistic. We didn't mess with the turtle. We put the turtle back and he went up getting the turkey. And I don't even know that he really, I don't even know that he's, I don't think that he's, he's even put it in his head yet where he's like, passed up the turtle, got the turkey. There's a life lesson for you. Like, I don't, yes. think, he's, I don't think he's at it. But here's the deal, man, about all this, like, just good being out there mentality. And it is, it's like, it's a, it's a trope in the outdoors. Oh, it's just good being out there. Just good being on the water. Any day fish, good, bad day fishing, better than a good day work and all these right things yeah but but uh there's a lot to be said about going out and being successful at something and being willing to like sacrifice about it so as much as we as much as people in in the kind of things i like to do and i'm sure there's other cases as well i can't think of oh yeah like you know you lose a baseball game i guess and then you're like well you know camaraderie and you know but listen, man, be honest with yourself. You were out there to win that goddamn game. You know? And, and, and so in this kind of thing, like, I, yeah, I, like, the, the, there's, a in, there's an end. In, like, there's a thing, like, in and of itself, there's a thing. Like, the pursuit is a thing. The skill set is a thing. But, like, I, I don't like to bullshit myself so much to think that those aren't, like, intentional thing one learn intentional things one learns in order to drive an outcome and driving the outcome is, is like success. Yes. Right. And, and it's like, you, 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 it sometimes feels a little dickish to be that. No, it's like better to get what you're after. Sure. Well, the Stokes would say there there's preferred indifference, right? <laughs> like indifferent TS, right? So you're like, look, uh, I'm I'm just out here 
I'm out here to enjoy myself, but I'm going to have more fun if I get the outcome than if I don't. Right. Um, okay. But then because you ultimately you don't food. control, because ultimately you don't control, right. You don't control what the animal does. You don't control what the weather does. You, you can adapt to those things, but it's like, look, when you write a book, you'd, you want it to be successful. You want it to sell a lot of copies. You want it to hit the New York Times bestseller list. You want it to reach people. But at the end of the day, you better also be happy with what you wrote and be proud that this was the best possible thing you could have done in the part of it that was up to you. Because ultimately, there could be a hurricane the day it comes out. You could die before it comes out. It could be rejected because it's too far ahead of its time. All these other things could get between you and that outcome. So you do have to find contentment in the process while still trying to follow the process in such a way that you set up your outcome as likely or probable. What I would worry about is that if you got to a mental place where you were able to if you got to a mental place where you were able to more graciously accept defeat, yeah, would there be an impact on your performance? Yeah, Peter Thiel has a good line, uh, show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. <laughs> yeah, if you get to where it just is like, this this preferred and like yeah I, I worry about there's a there's a phrase there's a term I didn't come up with it someone said he was describe a friend of mine was describing someone and he said uh, he has a lot of gur <laughs> like g r r r r r r r right and what that means is <laughs> fucking tenacity, man. You know? Sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> and that's and that is driven by someone who that having a lot of gur is someone who is is outcome focused. <laughs> but I would say gur is a double edged sword in riding and golf, probably in hunting, because I've seen you where like when you want it really bad or you're rushed. Or you feel like you don't have like the the clock is ticking, like you're gonna lose your when you force it, you're never as good as when you're coming mm-hmm. from a place of wholeness and patience and uh self-mastery, right? So so that gur can also be you know, in golf when you try to hit it really hard, that's when you that's when you oh. fuck it up. Yeah, it's it's a okay, it's a bracketed gur. The gur is a yeah. bracketed gur. <laughs> bracketed it's like, gur. <laughs> within there's like inviable that there's like parameters to this thing and they're inviable within that and and, and just in the the case we're talking about with with hunting in large measure um in 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 this country in large measure if you want to know what the right thing to do is you can 90 percent of the time find the answer by consulting your state's rule book like like the, the i'm speaking generally Okay. Yeah. Generally speaking, um, ethics as we understand them at this point in time in America are are, are largely like a, a product or there's a very tight relationship between our current ethical understanding around hunting and what we have codified into law. Sure. So if one says within that bracket of legality, um, I'm going to apply maximum GER <laughs> and I'm not going to feel – like I'm not gonna feel like I'm uh, too base to say that I really would like to find success here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you can't be the Zen Buddhist who just doesn't give a shit. You're not gonna get the you're not gonna get the outcome you want. It's a te- it's a tension. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, and uh, I think about that many. I, I think about that as a parent. I think about that as a person who works. I think about that as a person who fishes and hunts. Sure. So uh, transitioning to the, the new book, which I love, one one thought I had about what we're talking about, and then transitioning to to that. Uh, like you, I also am incredibly blessed in that, like my passion and my career are completely overlap. Like I get to do the thing that I would be doing for free if I didn't get paid for. It. I get to read books for a living, write about what I care about, 
And then I get paid even more money to go talk to people about those things or do this or make videos. Like I get to do what I love. Um, how do you, I, I imagine that left to your own devices, you'd spend a lot of days alone in the woods, right? And I, I mean, obviously you, you must travel a lot for the show and for mm-hmm. the business that you've built. How do you, how do you balance that? Like I'm one of the best in the world at what I do. I feel very fortunate that I get to do what I, I, I love to do. I'm also paid well for what I do. And the, like, I should be around at home with my family. Man, that, yeah, that's a primary tension in my life. And it would be there. Forget the professional stuff. It's a, it's a primary tension in my life of being like honoring the, honoring my commitment to my family and honoring like the gift w- like what it is that i instinctually feel like like i have to be doing um yeah. the only way i've found to really uh like total peace for me is to go do my calling or like what i, I don't want to call it calling that's not right to go do my my discipline you know as an outdoorsman, but to do it with my kids. Because then I don't have, I don't have the thing. I don't feel like I'm missing out on something. And I do feel like if I don't get out in the woods, like I feel guilty about that. Like, like I feel like I'm not paying attention to something that needs to be paid attention to. So I get a sense of guilt for that. Um, I get a sense of guilt for not being with my kids. So the greatest thing, and it's what I'll be doing this coming weekend is like to be out, in the woods with my kids. And then I'm at total peace because there's no part of me being like that. I'm not doing either of the things that I'm supposed to do. But in terms of professionally, like traveling, when I was a writer and you know, what am I saying? When I was, when I was only, I know that's not only a writer. I get it. It was my sole source of income. Like just actually like writing books as my sole source of income. I was gone a lot doing research, like a lot. Yeah. My, 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 the entire time I've been married to my wife for 14 years. There's never been a time in our relationship when I wasn't gone a lot. So this is not surprise anybody. Right. Yeah. But that absence, I'd be lying. If, if I came and told you that that absence, that, that frequent absence wasn't the primary tension in my life. Yeah. Like, that is the primary tension in my life. Um, what makes it particularly complicated is that much of what we have uh, in life is born of that absence, right? So it, 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 it's like a real thing. And it became, when, my, when I had my first boy, uh, and I would be leaving for a work trip, a couple of days wouldn't bother. A hunting me. trip. Yeah, or, or, or like, like yeah, honey yeah. trip, whatever I had to go away for work for. If I was leaving to go, yeah, typically if I was like going uh, when he was a little young, I remember sitting. Well, I'll tell you, tell you this: I remember sitting in the bathtub with my little boy, sobbing because I had to leave. This is when he's very yeah. young. It was like the first time I had to leave yeah. for a couple weeks, and my wife saying, "You need to pull it together because you're gonna, you're gonna <laughs> like." Give him like a, oh, uh, you're going to traumatize him yeah. carrying on like this, you know? And it, another point we got at about this was my wife also saying to me one day, she's like, when you come back and you come home, you expect a certain reception, you know? Yeah. And she said, if it's going to be that it's not a big deal when you leave, it's not going to be a big deal when you come home. <laughs> no, that's well said. And it's like, when you come home, get with the fucking program. Yeah. No, because the life continued without you. You're yes. the one that, that left. The, the train kept going. You got off the train. Now you're trying yeah. to jump back on the train. It can't stop for you. No. It's like, pe- like kids got to get out in the morning. They got to get breakfast. They got to go to school. It's like, it's not like a welcome home party. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's really hard. Uh, I went through this uh, with the pandemic because I, I travel a lot for 
for speaking, I, uh, my, my, sh- my trips are probably a little shorter than yours, but I was just gone all the time. Whenever an opportunity would come up, I would take it because this is my job and how long are the opportunities going to be there, right? It feels arrogant to say no to them. Then the pandemic happened and I spent like 550 days like in a row, not gone. Right. Like we went, we went places really? like we, yeah. Like we, we drove, play, like we took like the camera. Oh, yeah, that yeah, was the lo- away from your family. Yeah. 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 Just fi- let's say we, we went to like, I put my kids to bed 500 plus yeah. times in a row. Yeah. And you're just like, wow. Okay. This is something now, it's made it so much harder to be gone now. Like I just was in New York and Florida and Chicago and like, whereas before I'd be like, Oh, I'll spend an extra day in New York. I'll meet some people. Do-. Now I'm like, now I'm like, what is the fastest I can be in and out? Because uh, the opportunity cost of being gone became so much more vivid and real to me. It's been, it's hard to shake it, but you do like you, you that's also not sustainable, right? And it's, it, so it's a, it's a tension I'm thinking about a lot myself lately. Yeah, we, uh, well, we, when, when the pandemic hit, we were coming back from a family trip in Baja. So I'd already been with my kids for a week, came home, had to do a two week international travel quarantine. Then everything kind of was chaotic and I didn't have to travel. And, uh, and at six weeks we were like, there is like, absolutely. I have never spent six consecutive weeks with any of my kids. And dude, I loved it, man. The only thing I got sick of, the only thing I got sick of is waking up making coffee. I started to think there's got to be like another way because I felt like every morning walking into that coffee pot for that many weeks in a row felt weird. <laughs> What's weird too, though, is like, you're like, oh, I got to be home. I feel guilty when I'm gone. So like, late, I, like I finished a book in like January and now I'm just going through the, the page proofs of it now. Uh, and, and so I'm, I'm not writing, writing, right? Like I'm not in the creative writing space. Like I'm, yeah. I'm doing the administrative bullshit that goes into like finishing a book, which is, which is not creatively fulfilling. Right. And I can actually feel like when, when you do, when you have like a calling or a gift at what you do, there's also a cost to not doing it. Right. So if you were like, you know what, my kids need me, I'm going to stop hunting. I'm going to stay at home for the next year and see what happens. I imagine you'd be a lot less fun to be around and a lot less you because you don't have the outlet, you don't have the thing that's fulfilling you and giving you purpose outside of the home. Like I, I know I need to start a project soon, or my wife's going to be like, "You got to get the fuck out of here," uh, yeah, yeah. because yeah, like we can feel that energy, we can feel the pent upness inside you. Because I think part of the reason people become really good at a thing is to to solve some sort of you know uh, ennui or pain or you know, but it, you get good at a thing and it becomes kind of therapeutic. And then if you don't do the thing, then whatever that untreated part of you, it comes bubbling back up. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's the thing I like to tell myself to uh, make me feel better about everything is I tell myself <laughs> that, well, <laughs> one day, I'll, one day I shouldn't have gotten in trouble for this, but I did is uh, me and my buddy, Tony, took his kids and my kids. So we're me and my buddy, Tony and all of our kids go clam digging. But one thing that leads to another, it's a school night. One thing that leads to another, we're out like way late. Right. So you're, I'm thinking though, that like, how could, like, if you take one thing, as you know, if you're a parent with kids, the one way you can always win is take the kids to do something. Like there's no way anyone's yeah. going to get mad at you. Yeah. It's like, it's the greatest gift you can give anybody. You take everybody and leave. Like, no one's going to get that, or so you think. Yeah. But we wind up, uh, I get, I'm on the phone with my wife. She's not happy with me um, about the time. And my buddy Tony says, and I told my wife this, we always laugh, but my buddy Tony says, if we were the way they wanted us to be, they wouldn't like us. And I, my wife's like, that's so fucking untrue. <laughs> She's like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. But, I, but, but it's true. It's definitely true. It's definitely true. I used to want to write a book. We used to laugh about it. I was going to call it whipped, but I think now I'd call it homebody. 
is I wanted to stay home for a whole year, like not go anywhere for a whole year and write. And like, it'd be like a book that only I would enjoy. But uh, yeah. write a book about what it's like to sleep in the same bed 365 nights in a row. <laughs> Well, no, I like you're, you're standing standing about you're not, sitting, like, am I really standing here brushing my teeth again? <laughs> Ruby, you were saying about not being uh, being home for six weeks. Like, I don't think I'd not gone a couple months without traveling since I myself was a kid, right? Because like we would go on trip. Like, like never in my life had I been like not on an airplane for you know at least a couple times a month, and then to not do that, you're like, well, like so we live on this small ranch outside of Austin. And it was like, for me, what I do spring is like one of the busiest times. And so I've lived there seven, eight years. And it was like, oh, shit, we've been missing most of Blackberry season like every year. And we just like we're not aware of it, you know, mm-hmm. and, and because we were just physically not there. Uh, and and you you don't full you don't fully realize what you're missing when you've internalized a sort of a nomadic, uh, busy life. Uh, that's fulfilling and challenging, but also there is something to be said about being still for a minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was talking to a friend of mine very recently. He was, we were having the same conversation about the impacts of the pandemic and how it changed things. And he's, he's talking about all the, the, all of a sudden he's working from home and doing all of his phone calls from home. Yeah. And he's like, the things I learned about my yard. Like, I never really looked at my yard. (laughs) Yeah, totally. He said, I spent so many hours every day, like, walking around looking at my plants and looking at my garden and, like, contemplating one of my trees. He's like, man, like, I just immersed in it, you know, and it was great, right? My uh, my favorite part of the, the Outdoor Kids book is the story you're telling. This actually kind of pertains to exactly that. Your kids are playing on some mountain and they're like, oh, like I almost got bit by a scorpion. And you mm-hmm. were like, there's no scorpion. Uh, there's absolutely no scorpion. And, uh, and, and of course, it, it, this made them upset. And so you said, well, fine, find me the scorpion, which they promptly did, which is one of my rules, which is like, whenever my kids, they're like, I just saw a monkey riding a bicycle by the side of the road. <laughs> I never go like, no, you didn't. Because they're right like 100% of the time. Even if that thing is like literally or physically impossible, somehow that's what, like, they never lie. They always, but they're just m- so much more present than I am they notice the most absurd things, uh, which is to me a remind. Uh, I, th- I thought that was great. Your kids, y- y- your kids see something. Don't instinctively tell them that it's not there. Get them to prove to you that it's there, because you'll be surprised by what they manage to find. Being like your kids are never like, oh, I had no idea what my yard looks like. They know exactly what your yard looks like. Yeah. Oh yeah. 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 The the, the scorpion thing was funny because we had recently, you know, I was talking about being a Baja, so. When the pandemic hit, um, it, it they had someone had given them a black light. Okay, and I didn't even know this, but scorpions luminous. Yes, it's terrifying. It's terrifying. Oh, like, like it's like it looks like a like a man made creation. You know what I mean? Yeah, like a robot. They're walking thing or along something. all these trails out in the desert with this black light, and I mean these freaking scorpions, man, and like right. Looks like a glow in the dark toy laying there. Uh, I didn't know that about scorpions, so they were real keyed up on scorpions. I had never, ever, ever seen a scorpion in Montana, um, and thought they were very far to the south. But yeah, it wound up being the northern, uh, the northern scorpion. So I learned a lot, and on that, and I was talking about in the book on that same trip. I had never found like a big block of ochre, which. Uh, indigenous people used for dyes and all kinds of things, and, and it's a it's cave a, paintings too, right? Yeah, a common artifact. Yeah, they mix it with animal grease, so mix it with animal fat to make paints and skin dyes. Uh, they found a big block of ochre, and independently arrived at the idea that it makes a good skin pigment. You know, uh, so yeah, you do you do need to give them a lot of credit. There's a story we always laugh about my my older boy where one day we walked out of a friend, we were staying at a friend's place and we walked out and he's like, there's a coyote. And I look up, I don't see a coyote. I'm like, Jimmy, what are you talking about? 
And all of a sudden, like, there's a weasel. And I'm like, James, knock it off. And I look and like, right. there's right. a weasel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, at this point, like, you're right. At this point, when he says he saw something, I'm like, okay, where? <laughs> Well, and, and it's like, are you a person who encourages the curiosity or you shut the curiosity down with your jaded, cynical, I've seen it all beforeness, right? Yeah, so like, right. like, I think it's better to go like, oh, tell me about it. What is it? You know, I do the same thing when, when they tell me like random facts, you know, that they heard on a video or something. I'm like, really? Is that true? And then we Google it and probably 80% of the time it's like, <laughs> like, uh, you know, we, 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 we read some book and it was like, you know, owls don't poop or something. And, uh. And he's like, that's not true. And I was like, if it says it in the book, it's probably true, you know? And then he was like, well, I think we need to Google it. And we Google it and it, it turns out the book is wrong and he's right. And it's like, this is exactly what you want. You want them yeah. to challenge things uh, and you want to you want to go get the information as opposed to shutting it down and being like, I know more. It really, I'm bad. I'm good about natural observations. I'm bad when they're relaying videos to me. <laughs> It's it's just like it's a it's a real that that's one of my weaknesses as a parent is taking in information picked up from videos, but I've got yes. them trained up good where I'm like, do not ever come to me and say, there's a video where <laughs> it it needs to be. Where was the video, and how did you become aware of the video? Then tell me the story. So now they'll come up and be like. There's a YouTube video. Uh, my friend Teddy sent it to me. And then they'll tell me the story. I'm like, okay, now I'm tracking, but I just got to know. Yeah. Is it school? Is it like a friend? Like, what are we talking about? <laughs> well, you know, I think uh, what I liked about the book is, that, okay, first off, the idea of outdoor kids and indoor world. Great title. Even if people don't read the book, like buy the book and be like, I got 90% of what I need from the title itself. Like to me, that's a great mantra as a parent, right? Like great book, a great idea, outdoor kids, indoor world. Um, but I think they, the two feed off of each other. Like part of the reason we went on this Big Ben trip, even though we'd just been a year ago, is that he'd watched a video where you were in Big Bend, right? And so I think one of the things we've tried to do is like, you can in sort of instinctively be op opposed to screen time which would be ironic for people like you and me that make yeah, things yeah. that go on screens. But like, provided that the screens are stimulating interest in the outside world, that's great, right? So we try to think about stuff that way. Like, like mm -hmm. let's watch videos about places that we're going to go or let's watch videos about things we're going to do. So we took a trip to LA and it's like, we watched all these travel vlogs about going to LA and then he wanted to do a bunch of things like go on this streetcar and go to this and this and this, that like, frankly, if I just said, we're going to LA, he'd have been like, what is that? Yeah. I think when, 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 you know, in, in naming the book, uh, outdoor kids in an inside world, I was like, promote, I was, it, it's like an acknowledgement. It's not like I don't, I don't imagine it so much as it, it's not meant to be like a condemnation of the inside world. It's more like to say that, like, there is an intense gravity, an intense gravity that pulls kids inside now. And as I bring up again and again in the book, that gravity is made much greater w with the prevalence of screens. It's just they are powerful, right? Like, like media has a powerful pull and this has come from a person that's like, I make it for a living. There is no processed thing. foods versus natural foods. One yeah. is yeah, exactly. more yeah. addictive than the other. Uh, it is a daily conversation in my house. There's a daily conversation, often a daily argument about use of screens, right? It, it could be this, it could be like, that doesn't look like your homework to me. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And then you got to be like, well, no, because I'm actually was while well, I was Googling, uh, you know, the Han dynasty. But now I'm watching people have airsoft wars like, like you know, what yeah, I mean? like, yeah. but, you know, it really it, it relates, you know, or whatever. <laughs> like, it's just like it never ends. It never ends. Yeah. But I uh, like the approach I take rather than than, than this naive idea that I'm going to raise kids unaware of it. Not that I even have any desire to, because one of my kids thinks he wants to be a writer and i'm like that's a yeah. great idea right so 
what that means in the, the, the present day is like, you know, you're involved in media. I'm not going to act like it does a thing. But I do, like you're saying, encourage a deliberate consumption of it. You know, um, I don't like them to just get on, like, I, I don't like them to, to go to YouTube and just start consuming what's served. Yeah. Right. It's like, is there an objective? Like, what is the objective right now? Like, what, what path are you going down and take some control? Like, like, remember the path, take some control about the path you're on. We do it very much with we do it very much with books when, when my kids were young i man our books were about natural like we had a lot of kind of books the ones that we went out and deliberately got i got books about natural history animals dinosaurs evolution right hunting yeah what's fishing. the bird book you mentioned uh bird oh, song bible bird song bible that's the most important book we own it's a large format bird book that has an audio player in it i'm sure at this point it's probably gone to an app maybe i don't know but you just type man my kids love it you type in the number and it gives you the bird's vocalization i'm on my second one it's a phenomenal book the other most important children's book uh my brother in alaska sent it to me many years ago it was called possum um what's funny is i have the book it's hardcover robert mcclum you cannot find this book. I've looked because I wanted to gift it to people. It tells the story. I, I, I tell, I, I, I like give a synopsis of this book in Outdoor Kids in an Inside World. I, I give a synopsis of this book and why I like it. It tells the story of a possum mother who's pregnant. And she sets off with her young. And there is terrible attrition of the offspring a snapping turtle an owl a car a snake meanwhile they're eating baby mice they're stealing bird eggs from birds they're the bane of my existence in the end there's one female left she meets a male they spend one night together. She then has 13 babies. She only has 11 nipples. Two of the babies starve to death. And then the book ends. <laughs> and <laughs> Great for kids. Dude, it is, man. It's the it cycle is. of life in there. Because my kids are like... I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna come tell anybody my kids are perfect. They're far cry from perfect. My kids. A thing that's important to me is my kids are pretty tuned into the fact that there's life and there's death. Yeah, and it does. They do not live in fear of it, and they do not think that they can somehow avoid that reality. And when you put something in their hands, they never say "ew." Ever. Ever. Right? They'll eat anything. They'll they'll weigh it by what it tastes like. They do not weigh it by what it is. Sure. There's That's no there's no good. like you could tell them anything. I, I could be like uh it's a house cat. And they'd be oh, okay. <laughs> See how it tastes. <laughs> So we, we've been dealing with that because like from the pandemic and then living out in the country, like our kids are like feral animals. We've been yes. having to work on some some civilization. Like, look, hey, at this pool, you have to wear a swimsuit and you can't just pee <laughs> wherever you want. It's not like the, it, other people have rules. Like, sorry, you know, you can't you can't do that here. You know, what we just did is funny, man, is uh, my wife went and found like it's like the 13 most important table manners. Yeah. And she printed it off and it lives on the dining room table. And there's, that's a good idea. Well, here's the thing. Instead of every night trying to arbitrarily half ass like enforce certain manners, she's now like 50% of the nights. Like last night was not, was not a manners night. 
tonight is a manner's night. Man you night. lay that print out on the table and you need to abide by these 13 rules. The goal being, the goal being, when we're going into a thing, we're going into a restaurant, yeah. it's manner's night. <laughs> Yeah. Can you turn it on and off as opposed to blindly, blindly follow it? Because we realize that we cannot get out of them blind, universal adherence because it doesn't work because of this reason. You're all of a sudden at a picnic and everybody's you're like running around playing Frisbee with a hamburger in your hand (laughs) and their minds don't work that way. So then you go like, well, don't eat like don't get up without being excused. But, but last night, I was running around playing Frisbee with a hamburger in my hand. You know? So it has to yeah. be that it's on or off. <laughs> we're going to try that now. That's what we're trying right now. <laughs> no, that's great. I love that. We're I, I got one, always kind of on. <laughs> I got one last question for you. Um, one of the things, that, one of my favorite passages when I was rereading it, because I read American Buffalo before I had kids, then I read it. It, it hits you differently. As, it, as they say, you can't step in the same river twice. You talked about your dad uh, quite a bit in American Buffalo, but you mm-hmm. talked about this thing that goes through your head every time you're hunting, this test, which to me is, a, is an, an interesting stoke thing. You're like, am I being pragmatic or am I being a candy ass? And yep. uh, how do you think about that in life and then also with kids? Because it is, it's like, I try to be expedient. I try to be smart. I, do, I try not to do uh, things that are stupid at the same time. I don't want to be a wuss, you know? Uh, and so how do you think about that balance and what's that voice that's running through your head even now from, from what you got from your dad? Uh, I, I still, I, I have a version of it still. I, I can think of just, you know, a few days ago making a decision like that where there was a thing, you know, out where uh, I was out hunting in a wilderness area and there was two options and they were they, they were like uh, at face value it was like six in one and a half dozen in the other right potential outcome one was four miles more away yeah uh i i like in the end i was like i have to do the four mile away one because why is it in my head that i'm leaning toward the other one like am i allowing that Like, is there some reluctance to walk over there? And so then I'm like, I'm just going to dispatch the, the, and I'm going to do that one because I'm going to make myself do the one that's that way. Do the harder one? Yeah. I don't want to be the kind of person that subconsciously is like ruling out labor with my kids. What I, the the primary thing I find it is I want them to learn things, but it's harder to have them help. Yeah. Cleaning fish. Cleaning fish, I can do it faster and better. Right? It'll take three times as long and all the flays will be messed up if they do it. Sure. If you're like a person that's like kind of like a perfectionist and shit, that shit's hard. <laughs> but like I force myself to be like, I'm gonna do the longer, less perfect version because if they don't learn this now, they'll never learn it. Do you think about that voice in your head? There's a, a great Bruce Springsteen thing where he says, like, are you an ancestor or a ghost to your kids? Right. Like, are you oh. what voice? What voice in your head are they? And I think about, unfortunately, a lot of the things I have from my dad are not like positive, like life building up things. They're unfortunately negative. How do you think about because ultimately we are the voice in our kids heads. Right. How do you think about the voice that you put in their head? Man. My dad did a lot of great things. My dad did a lot as a dad. He did a lot of great things. He did a lot of horrible things. Uh, I'd like to say that I, I'd, I, I like to think that I am bringing to my kids those good things that I learned from him. And I like to think that I am intentionally filtering out the bad things, though I understand every impulse that must have been driving him. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I know why you did what you did. I can see it now. I don't like it. You shouldn't have. 
but I understand this shit is frustrating. It's hard to raise kids, you know? Yeah. 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 That's where that self-discipline comes in, right? The yes. like, I could do this. I could probably get away with this. It's not illegal to do this, but it's not right to do this. Yeah. I do it all the time, man. I may, I, you know, I'll lay in bed at night and I'll be like, you know what? Like parenting shit. I'll be like, that, that's got to end. You cannot do that anymore. You can't freak out yeah. on everybody like that. Yeah. You're going to fuck I've been, them up. <laughs> you know? I've, I, there's not a single time I've ever lost my temper around my family that afterwards I was like proud of myself. <laughs> you know, it never ages well. Oh, no, You're like, like, what the, what my the God, fuck? that was the right <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, I'm always, uh, oh my God. When well, anytime I'm frustrated or rushed afterwards, I'm like, I cared about that. Like what? You, or you know what I mean? Like you're like, uh, like you, you walk into our garage, it's all covered. They were drawing all over the garage. And I remember I was upset the first time I saw it. Now, every time I walk by, I see the crayons on the garage. It makes me happy. Right. <laughs> and so why couldn't I, why couldn't I have been there? You know what I mean? I have no plans to sell this house. And even if I do, how, how hard is it going to be to cover up some crayons? But I took it, you know, at the time, I inheriting from my parents, like, you know, you can't drink that in the car. You're going to spill it all over the place. Who gives a shit? <laughs> you know, in retrospect, who gives a shit? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's vaxxing. And, and I'll tell you that, uh, I think about this book, um, the minute we found out my wife was pregnant 12 years and nine months ago, whatever my agent, uh, who I've been with a long time he knows Mark, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mark Gerald. He's like, man, you got to write a book about how you're going to sort of like handle your kids and, and, and your relationship with nature. Like how will you impart that on them? How will you give them what you got? You know? Yeah. yeah, so I think it's a little premature right now, right? But he <laughs> like, and it gradually became my own idea. Or I became to own the idea, but it took rather than uh, you know, it took me this many years to land in a spot where now I have a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, a twelve-year-old. I've landed in a spot where I'm not going to come and say to someone I would never present myself as a parenting expert or something. But when it comes to like kids and nature, um, I have racked up uh, a level of subject matter expertise about like the, the, the hands on practical aspects of it. Right. And a lot yeah. of lessons learned. And, yeah. um, and, and I definitely present the, 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 in the book, I present the ways and wh where I feel like I've messed up, where I've fallen short. What I've learned that I think would be good for parents to know who parents who do want their kids to feel at home at eye level with nature, right? Like I feel that there's a lot in there, but man, I am not perfect as a dad. I'm not perfect as a husband. I would never act like I am. I would be very uh, suspicious of anyone that claims otherwise. They're probably the worst. Like, you know what I mean? Oh, you know what's funny about that is whenever someone tells me how bad their kids are, I always just, I'm always like, I bet your kids are pretty great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The parent who's like, oh, dude, my kids are nuts. I'm like, yeah, I bet they're all right. <laughs> no, I I think about that when I, whenever like my wife's like, am I doing enough? Am I screwing up? Like, are we depriving them of something? I go, you know who's not thinking about that? The people that are actually not doing enough and depriving <laughs> their kids. Like that, you're even thinking about the question. You're like. My parents weren't thinking about that question, right? And like, like yeah. my parents didn't didn't think about if I was getting enough water or not. You know, like I was just asking my mother in law. I was like, ever once did you think about whether Samantha was hydrated? And she's like, I've never considered that in my life. And I'm like, and yet you probably got upset when she threw a temper tantrum or she was acting weird. It's like there's just the things that they weren't even aware to care about. You yeah. know, uh, you're you're doing fine. Like you're doing great. Yeah, it's funny. The dehydration thing. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> I, th I think 90% of the time they're hungry, they're tired, or they're dehydrated. That's mm. why they're acting like a crazy person. Not because yeah. they're shitty. <laughs> <laughs> Not because you raise an asshole. <laughs> yeah. You've forgotten that, man. It's on you. 
Well, dude, this is amazing. I love, I love the new book. This one I think is an all time classic and, uh, the, the two hunting books are great and I've used them both and, uh, cooked many things from them. Great. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to come on and talk about it, man. I really, it's, it's kind of you to do it. All right. Well, I'll talk to you soon.